Hello, friends. Welcome to the show to be named later. I'm your host, Johnny Voss, alongside the newest general manager of the Minnesota Twins. Do we have a, a Falv Zinger going? Is that is that the deal? Yeah, Falv Zinger is the, uh, the new term around town, so uh, get used to it. I got t-shirts coming. Right on, man. Okay, so of course we have Noah Storzinger down in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, I, I first of all, I want to take this time, you know, I got to... I gotta gotta apologize if there are some faithful uh, viewers out there. Uh, I was on vacation last week, so it's been a couple of weeks, and we have a lot of things to cover. Uh, I kind of feel like Carlos Correa or Byron Buxton because you never know when uh, I guess I'm going to be in the lineup. Um, but there were reasons why I was on vacation last week, and we'll get into that um, very very quickly. Now. Um, I know that you've got to work today, so I have no idea how we're going to cover two weeks of everything that's gone on on three different landscapes. Uh, but, uh, you know, here we go, guys. We've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. And here's what I'm going to do, Noah Storzinger, since you are the general manager. I am going to allow you to pick what you want to go with, the, the good, the bad, or the ugly. It's uh, it's gentleman's choice as far as what what you want to what you want to tackle first. Let's start with the ugly. Okay. I'm curious what I, that's for you. Okay. And that's what I'm worried that we're going to be here for the next uh, two hours before we're even able to uh, to touch upon anything else. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the, the ugly I, I'm guessing that he is referring to is your Minnesota Twins. And uh, never in the history of this franchise, we've seen bad teams, but we have never seen a collapse uh, by a Minnesota twin, Twins baseball team like the one that we saw in 2024. Talking about a team that had a, I believe it was a 98% chance in late August to make the playoffs. And I believe the Detroit Tigers had a 0.02% chance to make the playoffs uh, in, in September even. And the Twins decided to, to go forward by going 12-29 and 29 in the last, I, I mean, when was the last time they won two in a row in, in that stretch? I don't remember, right? Yeah, the I, biggest, I don't know. yeah, the biggest collapse. Now, I remember 84, and that was that was pretty bad. And, you know, people always ask me, well, why do you buy a, buy a newspaper every day, Johnny? Well, because in 84, you couldn't watch every game, and, and that's what you had to do to, to, to find out how bad your team was. Now, this year... Um, I would have preferred not to watch every game in the last 40 some games or, or whatever, but yeah, biggest collapse. And this is what I want to get to. And I'm, I'm going to let you start. You know, there's a lot of blame to go around. I, I, I don't think that you could say it's one area or it's one person. I mean, it spreads all the way across the board, but I'm going to let you, uh, Mr. Storzinger go first with what you, what you would like to, uh, what you would like to, go ahead and, and, and go with blame, I guess. Well, well, first I want to say, um, this is the, the reason why I think baseball is the best sport ever is because unless you're the Chicago White Sox, you're never truly out of it. And right. what the Tigers are doing, man, that is so cool. And I, they're the hottest team in baseball right now. Um, I think they make the world series this year. That's my prediction. Wow. Um, yeah. That's a yeah. bold statement. They're that good right now. Okay. Um, Anyways, you know, it's when we had talked about it, I remember a couple podcasts ago and I said, you know, you know, the twins are going to make the playoffs. And, you know, I, I, I had some doubts and I, I will say you, you didn't think so. And I'll give you that one. Um, but, but once we hit the last two weeks, I was like, oh my gosh, we're, we're not going to make the playoffs. Like this, this is yeah. going to be the biggest collapse. And I was talking a lot of shit the whole year about this twins team talking to Royals fans, Tigers fans, whatever. Um, and man, am I getting my, my ass kicked right now in terms of, of, of what I have to deal with. And it, it it's the hard part with the blame is, is it, it, it's, it is truly spread in multiple different facets of the organization when it comes to the owners, the coaching, the players, and it, it's hard to pinpoint one person because it truly is just a, a, a team of 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 blame that that this goes around to and that's what's super frustrating right now right and we we let's start at the top right away because you know the we we all know that 
La Pola Nostra, they're, they're pieces of shit. And, and I think that I've already made that very, very clear that, you know, I've, I've had to bite my tongue walking by him at games. Um, but the way that he went about uh, and, and, you know, I think we talked about it early before the season even started that the twins had a real opportunity to build a fan base. That's already very, very loyal uh, to, to this team and that they better be damn sure that they knew what they were doing going in with, with the team that they, they went forward with. Now um, that being said with, with the poll ads for 70% of the year, they thought that they were, they were riding it pretty good. Right. I mean, it, it would be hard for in, in retrospect to look back and go, all right, if they made the playoffs with their reduced roster, the reduced payroll, you would say as a businessman, because he reminded us many times this week, it's a business and I care about the fans. No, you don't. Okay. But you, you can't blame him if he is running it like a business because for most of the year, except for the first month of baseball and the last month of baseball, it looked like that he was going to get by with a free pass. But to me, the, what, what, when he came out the day after the, the season ended, it, it was like, all right, you've already stabbed the fans in the back. Now you're twisting the knife ever so slightly and it wasn't ever so slightly it was it was so much the the things that were said and how he to me he was patronizing twins fans all over and and so yeah i get it it's a business and you almost got by with it but you didn't and now then i hear that we're not going to slash payroll but there's still right now on the books at 5 million less than what they, they spent this year for next year. Right. So it's going to be the same thing. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, I, <clears throat> they, it was a business decision when he came out and said that, which I thought was, was, it's not what the fans want to hear. Why would you come out and say that? I, I don't right. understand that. And the whole, like, okay, we're not, yeah, we're not going to cut payroll based off of the rumors. I think if we had made the playoffs, I think they still would have cut more payroll next year. Um, because we would have made the playoffs. It would have been different. Um, I'm glad karma came to bite him in the ass uh, in terms of, you know, I, I'm glad. I'm almost at this point glad we didn't make the playoffs so he can at least oh. figure his shit out um, because I don't think rewarding him with a playoff berth was 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 right in my head. But um, the hard part with, with not cutting the payroll is you got all these arbitration eligible guys that are due for a price or, or a, a salary increase, including Willie Castro, who's going to make – almost 7 million um, in arbitration. Yep. You got Ryan Jeffries, Mike, Mike five. You're going to see You're going to have to trade off a lot of these guys. And, and I, right. I because care. right now there are five guys who are eating up a majority of your salary. One of them being Christian Vasquez who is one of the top five, most highly played uh, paid players on the team. Um, you know, and, and we're, we'll get to, we'll get to the players a little bit down the road because there is a lot that we need to discuss about personnel. Um, but you know, you know, I, I'm sorry, pull that. Fuck you. Because you created this and you were riding such a high. And I think that we, we commented it on it when, when the season started that you have so much to build on by finally winning a playoff series and you completely alienated your fan base by the way that you went about it. And now to watch, and here's the thing you brought up Detroit and, and I'll bring up Detroit and Kansas city. I'm not threatened by them. And I, I'm not cheering against it. If it would have been the white Sox, Yeah, I would have been um, guardians or Indians. I, you know, I, I have no love loss for them either, but Detroit and Kansas city, that's kind of a feel good story. And, and I, I, I want them to do well in, in the playoffs. I feel cheated that we're not in the playoffs, but then again, it would have been so incredibly hard to watch the Minnesota twins in the playoffs this year, because they would have scored maybe one run in the whole entire series. And you would have watched guys like Miranda go over the series and, and just no timely hitting at all. It would, it would have been piss poor. Um, but you know, like I say, I am very fearful, not for the poll ads, but for the twins organization, because I think that you are losing 
some of your fan base going into next year. And especially if you're going to have a piss poor season next year, which is what we're looking at. Yeah. It, it, they've definitely alienated a, a lot of, a lot of fans, especially maybe not the, the loyal ones. I mean, look like a fan like you or me are going to, going to absolutely watch almost every game next year. It's just what we do. But, but a lot of those fans that you built, last year especially during that playoff run and, and i saw all the videos from all the memories from last because it happened last year when we won that playoff series and everything and vibes were riding high and I, you just i think you you lost a lot of those those fans that were like wait we went through all that and we're not in the playoffs again this year and you know what what's going on um you got controversy in the media now it, it, it's why does it always seem to feel like it happens so quickly when you feel like you're just riding that high and it, it, it just tanks right. so quickly? And and I saw a comparison um, the other day, um, and I was younger growing up through this era, but the whole Polads are cheap mentality or, uh, um, I guess, reputation through the Metrodome days, people were doing calculations on payroll and what we have now and everything. And Technically, right now, we are cheaper than we've been during those Metrodome days, which is extremely sad because the whole right. idea of, you know, it was all oh, build this, build a stadium and we'll, we'll go, we'll go spend money and we'll, we'll bring in more, more fans. We'll bring in more uh, free agents, whatever. No, we're cheaper than we have been in the past. So something's right. got to change because it, it it's, it's just frustrating. Well, okay. And so. When I, when I talked about the knife being turned the very next day, because I, I thought for sure after the monumental absolute disaster that the last uh, four weeks of baseball was in Minnesota, I thought for sure it was welcome to Toby Gardner. I thought for sure that was. And the very next day, oh, we're not making a move. We still got Rocco. That's great. And in a world that... It seems like no one has to take accountability at all. Now let, let's let's get to Rocco because there's there's a caveat to this that that I think should be we mentioned the Falvine era is done now in Minnesota. Um, so you got Levine that that leaves, and there are some people saying that he is the scapegoat in all of this. Now there's a lot of different ways that this has been spun with uh, with with Mr. Levine. All right. There's national uh, publications that are saying that the reason he is no longer with the twins is because yes, he is the scapegoat. Um, now there's rumblings here in the twin cities of the same thing. I read an article today and then there's a lot of folks within saying, no, that's not really the case that the, the Falvine experiment was great but now he needs to go and spread his wings and find what he can do. But the article I read really didn't paint it that way. They, they painted it in a manner in which uh, Falvey was the one that was really making all the calls. And Levine wasn't really had any part of what was going on. So he was basically useless. And I think Levine made the quote or something like uh, he was, uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, the flying maid. Disney chick, uh, Tinkerbell? no, the maid, the, the English maid, uh, Mary Poppins, right? Oh, Is that right? Yeah. And I, I believe he made the quote that said, you know, I'm Mary Poppins. Now the kids can make their own lunch and they can dress themselves and they can sing their own songs. There's no, no use for me any longer, but there was a lot of, it, it seemed like there was a lot more to the story. That, that he was maybe ousted or maybe he did not see eye to eye any longer with Falvey. I, I don't know because, once again, you, you're never going to get the whole story. But, you know, he doesn't have a job right now. And he said, I'm, I'm curious to see what testing free agency is going to be like. But with nobody being held accountable, it seems like Levine was the one that was. So, you know, I, I think it was probably about a 50-50. I think the people that were held more accountable were more of the coaching staff, the, all the hitting coaches. They let go. We, yeah. can, we can get there. But, um, you know, it's – Felvey, I think, was was more the majority player when it came to signing guys and, and, and doing all that stuff. Um, I think Levine had had somewhat of a part, but, but I think – again, I think it was probably a 50-50 – 
shot, um, whether it was he was fired, whether he wanted to move on. I'm sure he felt some constraint from ownership. Um, which well, his contract, on, but... his contract came up. His, okay. his contract expired and the twins decided not to renew it. Now, <clears throat> that's what I mean. Was it, you know, one of these, no, it was, no, we both broke up. It was, it was completely, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I think there is a lot more to the story than what we know. And, you know, and I, I wish him that Levine, the, the, the best of luck um, in the future. But I find it interesting that if there are national publications and now rumblings here in, in Minnesota, that he is looked at as the scapegoat um, with nobody taking accountability at all for this. And we're going to get to, I mean, Rocco, do I think he should be the manager next year? Absolutely not. And the reason being is because of all the knucklehead, sorry, Tim Waltz, uh, all the knucklehead decisions that he made when you needed a manager to make incredibly smart decisions with what he had. And there were a lot of winnable games in that last four weeks. And he made these completely ridiculous maneuvers that didn't turn out well for him. You know, I, I think I was going to be okay if Rocco was, was fired. Um, but I'm not, I don't mind that he's back only because when you look at ball clubs like this, um, Look, it was six weeks of a shitty of shitty baseball um, right at the end, unfortunately. Do I think he was a hundred percent to blame? Absolutely not. I think no. what he, I think he had he was working with what he had. Do I think he could have maybe there were some motivation aspects or or maybe like I, it just feels like there was more going on on the player side, and that's who I'm blaming a little more at this point. But when it comes to organizations that have winning cultures and, and, and everything, I, you need continuity. And I, and I, I kind of like that Rocco's back and he's been one of the most winningest managers so far uh, for, for years and years. And you can't deny that he's won a lot of games um, as much as we hate to, to, or we, we shit on his, some of his decisions. I mean, it's not like every manager doesn't make shitty decisions. I, I question some of them, but there are, but in my head, in my head, I think it's more, more the players of this because they did yeah. not want to play. I don't know, but, but, but how much does that come from on top? So if, if you lose a team and, and that, that's what he did. He lost that team in the last month of baseball. You could find no way to motivate them to win a game, to make the playoffs. You have everything in front of you. Okay. As a player, he was not able to motivate whatsoever. You are stealing you're having Trevor Larnick steal when he come back the first day from an injury. And all they kept saying on TV was he's hobbled. That's why he's not in the, in the field right now. And he has him stealing. How about uh, that, that poor, uh, that poor young man putting uh, what's his name Enrique, right? The, the, the young kid who had never closed a game in his, in his career, put him in the most, crucial part of a game in the biggest game of his career. And he had never closed a game and nope, we're going to, we're going to ask you to show us the way that's bullshit. And then they, they sent him down the very, what, three, four days later. Okay. Um, talked about Bailey over, Oh, I've got 85 pitches and they can't hit me. Let's let's yank them. But when you put that together with the fact that he could not motivate this this squad whatsoever. And he took no responsibility. Did you ever hear Rocco say it's on me? It's my fault. I never did. There were a couple, there were a couple pressers that he did, but it, it, it wasn't in the media as much. Um, but you know, it, yes. I, and I'm not denying the motivation aspect at all. I mean, I've had plenty of coaches I thought were fantastic coaches. Could they motivate for shit? No, but do I still think they're great coaches? I, I do. Um, in that aspect, I, again, like, I don't want to fully put the blame on Rocco when I think, and, I and, and, and maybe, maybe in my head, there was something going on in that clubhouse on the player side that was screwing a lot of things up. And one of my theories is the players were very, very, very frustrated that ownership did not allow them to go get pieces to build well, on get, this team. You know what? Get over it, bitches, because you you still had a very, very good opportunity. And, and as far as from a player 
perspective, you can say, you know what? F you because nobody thought we could do this and look at how good we are at this. Yeah, but we're going to, we're going to get to the players because there is something there as well. But you know, when I talk, I mean, and I, I'm not trying to put everything on Rocco. I'm just saying, if you are going with a somewhat change because things didn't go the way that you wanted to this year, I, I would have been okay with the Rocco um, firing. However, we talk about no accountability, but yet there was accountability. In the same breath, they announced that, and like uh, Pop, Pop and Fresh, Popkins Fresh, right? The hitting coach, he's gone. Um, they fired uh, infield coach Tony Diaz, Pop and Fresh, Derek Shimon, Rudy Hernandez. And the thing about it is, Tony Diaz was one of the first guys that Rocco uh, hired when he got the job here. Now, now my point is, is that they. The things that he said about his guy. Now, Diaz is his guy, but I, I want to read this. Um, it says, as for Diaz, um, Baldelli said, we're implementing a lot of different things from the work that we do before the game on the field to the work that we're going to do be, uh, be doing before the game off the field. From preparation to the mental side of the game, there's there's going to be a lot of new things being implemented. And as hard as it is to do, I thought having a new infield voice, being able to take that project on from the very start would help us. That sounds like blaming somebody else. I'm sorry, it does. Because he's the infield coach, our infield was atrocious. I agree. There was I probably, I, I mean, I think he laid it out. He said, look, their preparation sucked. What they did before the game sucked. What they did after the game sucked. We need a new. We need a new face. It, okay. All right. Well, I agree with that. I'm all um, for him being fired. It was horrible. I I agree, and and we have talked about that. I mean, the the minor coaches in in the Twins organization for years has been atrocious. From the strengths and conditioning coaches to the hitting coaches to the pitching coaches, all the way across the board. Um, but then it, it's time to find someone. And, and like I say, you know, uh, Diaz was here for quite a few years. You're going to say that just this year, it, that's when it started that, that the pregame planning, whatever the voice in the, in the dugout, this just happened this year. I mean, sometimes guys lose, like it, it's sometimes coaches lose interest. Sometimes there's, you know, it's, it's, have you ever sat back and said, besides Carlos Correa, have you ever sat back and said our infield defense was phenomenal? No, ever. It, it was at, no, I, I was bitching about it all, all year about how bad it was. And so that brings me, um, I think we can get to be, unless you have anything else you want to say about management, ownership, managers uh let's get to the players i think yeah. because yeah. when you say that there's a lot of blame or I, we said there's a lot of blame to uh to pass around i think that a majority of the blame does uh fall on the roster but now that goes back to ownership saying these are the guys we're going with we're going to go with younger guys who have not proven anything really as of yet and uh don't have the experience to go along with it. And they almost, like we say, they almost got away with it. However, next year you are looking at a team. I think that is going to look fairly, fairly similar. Right. And, and, you know, I, I read, let, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but there, there were a lot of things that were concerning about this team, obviously hitting wise defensively, fundamentally wise and and you're talking about the same team going forward probably they ain't going to make a lot of additions um i think a a hell of a lot of blame comes falls right on 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 the players that were on the field yeah and you know it's i think it's hard when you've lost you know as much as you had carlos correa back at the end of the year um you got buxton back for a week um I, it's it's hard when you've got and I don't necessarily want to throw blame on the young guys like a Zebby Matthews, a David Fe David no. Fess actually had one of the highest uh I can't remember the stat he had or like he created the most war or whatever in the past month or so. But um 
it's tough to put blame on those guys because how, how, how are they supposed to know what they're doing? They're 22 year old kids that started an A ball basically this year. And now you're, you're trying to get a postseason berth uh, in the final month of the season. I, I look at, you know, a lot of the more, the vets that, that just had no, no fight to win, or it seemed like there were, there were no, um, just, just any ounce of, of care in the world to continue to try to nope. win. Um, and I have no, no idea what happened. I, I don't, but it, you know, you're way better than that. Well, so, you know, we talked about if they had made the playoffs, I mean, look, look at your starting, like if you're going to go with this rotation again next year, here's the thing. They ran Woods Richardson into the ground. We would have not even had a number three starter going into the playoffs had they made it. You know what I mean? Unless you're going to go with Festa or um, Zebby, which would have been, I think, nightmarish, which means that you're going with spot starts and, you know, people going to, I'm going to take this inning and then you got the next. And what does that mean for our bullpen? But I mean, if you break down just about every position, there's not a lot of bright spots. You know, my buddy, and you can, you know, MSNBC, you can fact check me on this, but my buddy brought up a point, um, and I, I guess I had to think about it. The last time we had a regular everyday left fielder was Josh Willingham. How is that possible? Eddie Rosario, I'd say, was was probably oh, yeah, our yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was our, I thought he played right starting out a little bit. No? No, you had Max Kepler still out there. You did have Kepler, who's he's done. Now, but okay, you're right. You're right. Um, yeah, I always forget about Rosario. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, okay. But now let, let's break it down. You, you still don't have a left fielder. You don't have a right fielder. Will Castro, you brought up Patrick Royce of all, all guys. Cause we're going to get to his article here in a second, but he's like, eh, I guess you could give Castro you know, when, when he wants the money, if he's still playing, no, you want a guy like Will Castro on this team comparably to everything else that you got going. You still have the conundrum with your two best players. Okay. Like the outfield is, is, a, a is in shambles right now. It is. Well, yeah. once you say Walner's the everyday left fielder. Y yes. And would but, Larnick be your everyday right fielder? Larnick can't get through a season. Well, this was Larnick's best year. You have to give him that one. I, I will, but he, was he was he an everyday player though? He no, was and, up again, right? He he's a fourth outfielder kind of guy, in my opinion. Fourth outfielder DH kind of kind of role. Um, so now you're going to make him your third outfielder. Um, I, I'm okay with Walner, I guess, but it still brings up the two best players that you got. And I've, you know, I would, but I had to say that the last two weeks, I was impressed with the only real leader you have on this team right now is Carlos Correa. Okay. But how much are you going to be able to get out of Carlos Correa in next year, much less down the road? Byron Buxton, still same thing. I, I was really pleased when he was playing for us this year. But that's been my biggest hang-up, okay? Um, I'm going to set a special side to Royce Lewis because you might not be pleased with what I'm going to say about Royce, okay? Um, second bait, I mean, Brooks Lee, first year, rookie year. Um, is he is he going to be the guy um, that we want? Miranda, same thing. Um, Jeffers, I mean, he, he did hit a lot of home runs for us, but defensively, he is a liability. I think he's getting traded. Your 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 rotation right now is I, I'm I'm sorry. I I don't want to go with the Festa, Zebby Matthews, Woods Richardson, and then the, the other two good guys. But that's what I, we're gonna go with, right? I kind of like the rotation next year. Oh, Judas. And you know, to show that they don't know what they're doing, though, Noah. You know who they're talking about, maybe instituting into the starting rotation because he wants to Chris Paddock. No, no. Oh, he's the other guy that's top five paid on this fucking roster. Oh, no. He's getting traded too. Oh, well, hopefully uh, for yeah. a bag of chips. No, the guy that wants to pitch, he started out as a starting pitcher, but he really? had such a fantastic year last year in his role that they're saying, well, I don't know if we really want to do it, but 
they really been talking about this week. You know what I'm talking about, right? No. Griffin Jacks. No, Jack sucked as a starter. No, 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 no. But that's because that he was young. He didn't know. He's even came out and said that that I did not. I I wasn't even close to the guy. I was I didn't have the pitches that I had when I was a starter. That's where I want to be in my in my major league career. I want to be a starter. And even Rocco said, "Well, I don't know. You did such a damn good job this last year doing what you did. I don't know." That's what I'm saying though. Is that do they have a plan? Well, in my head, you run down the rotation. It, Pablo's still your ace. Uh, you know, Bailey Ober. I think this will like. I thought he was 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 very good this year, yeah, um, minus great. one or one or two starts. But yep. um, Joe Ryan's coming back. People forget that we have Joe Ryan um, for half a year. And um, but then you look at your your bottom two. Um, do I still want them to go get a starter? Absolutely. But yep. look, you got another year of, of Simeon who, who had a, yes, we ran him into the ground, but now this guy's built up and ready to pitch. Um, I hope I, I, I like him. Yeah. And then you go with David Festa, who I thought got some really, really, really good experience last year. I think will be a lot better um, with a, a year under his belt. And then, the, then you have depth at that point. So you got Zebby who's going to start at triple a um, you've got Marco Raya down in triple a, you got Corey Lewis down in triple a, who I think, um, can impact the club next year. So I, you know, I hope Louis Varlin doesn't touch a start ever again in his life because he, he needs to, I don't to, think he will. He, yeah. Um, but no, I, you know, I don't, I don't mind the rotation. Truthfully, your, your top three guys are good are really good. Um, okay. But that, that's, that's the, you know, I'm a huge Joe Ryan fan, but my buddy brought this up, um, the other day and said, I just don't think that Joe Ryan, his body is going to get through a, a full season. I just don't. Um, and, and you know, that's all speculation. Uh, but I mean, I, I want the best for Joe Ryan. I love, I love him. I, even when he sucks, I, I like Joe Ryan, but um, we'll see now. And you bring up good points. Eh? I don't want to be this doom and gloom, but, but you got to understand this was a hard, hard year. And now as I'm watching, Detroit play right now in the playoffs. I mean, I feel cheated for not being able to see my team in the playoffs, a team that I didn't even, I, I know would be hard to watch in the play. I mean, you, you can't have it both ways, but I will say this, what's that well, was to say just with Detroit, as much as I didn't want them in the playoffs, uh, Tarek Skubal is a dog yeah, he's a and I'm, I'm glad he's in the can pitch in the postseason. Yep. Yep, the only uh, the only one better right now is my boy Skeen, man. He, that that's the only one that I like better. I mean, um, and like I say, I I do, I I it would not kill me to see the Royals or the Tigers go far in the playoffs or even win a World Series. That would not uh, crush me as a American League Central Minnesota Twins fan. Now, Don't Tigers are getting their ass. What's that? Don't give me Casey winning another championship. I don't need to see that down here. Okay. All right. Yeah, fair enough. Now, you might disagree with me on this one, um, but mention Carlos Correa. All, I mean, he's he's just a leader. He, he is. I've got so much respect for that guy, except for the cheating. Um, but he did some calling out at the end of the year um, you know, and, and I think that he probably, I mean, I mean, I don't know what the deal was with him. If he came back before he was supposed to, because he was, he was trying to be a leader in that way, or if he was holding out and he could have played earlier, I don't know. I'm not there holding the flashlight, but I know that he did come out, um, and took some responsibility and told, and, and had the players take responsibility and guess who got butt hurt? Mr. Royce Lewis. Got a little butt hurt by Carlos Correa's uh, words. And then what R Lewis said at the end of the year, and, and you know, Mr. I don't do slumps. Boy, it's a little different when you have to play every day, isn't it? When you can't take three months off. And, and I don't want to hate on Royce Lewis because of all the things like you're like, oh, but, and I know it's one year, but Royce Lewis 
did not look like the guy that we thought he was going to be. What, he had 15 home runs in his first 30 games? Not 30 games, but it seemed like that. And then he won the rest of the way, right? And and then to come out and say, oh, I don't do slumps and that. But he was not, hey, guess what? You miss every time you swing on the first pitch, right? Every time. But then to come back, and then he started bashing management a little bit and saying, well, that's what you get when you put all your eggs in with these young sheep guys and blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry. He seemed a little bit like a bitch. And and. I had two of my friends who were huge Royce Lewis fans. They texted and they had, don't even talk to each other and said, boy, Royce looked a little, little, little like a bitch, huh? And I got to agree. Yeah, it wasn't a good, I don't want to say it was a good, you know, it wasn't a good look. Um, do I think people are reading into it a little too much? I, I think so. He's a young kid who just doesn't, he's never experienced this kind of shit before. Um, whereas Carlos is, is a vet who, who, knows what he's doing uh bottom line where where Royce just just doesn't and I think he's still trying to deal with having a shitty year I mean this guy has been on cloud nine for his whole career really um right, and has a bad to. year um you know he we we, we have a, a tank at the end of the year guys are calling people out I just I, I think he needed some more media training I guess um because he I just think he was a little stupid in, in not knowing the right thing to say do I think it wasn't a good thing to say at all. And no. and if, if he truly is butthurt and, and being a bitch, then man, that's not a good look. I, I'm still a big Royce fan. I still think he's going to be really I, good. Um, I want to be, but, but he's not, I, I don't think that he can have two more years like this where, you know, suddenly we, we don't hold him accountable either. Or, you know what I mean? You, you can only go by so many grand slams that you hit in your first two years of, of your career. And, uh, he was not, I mean, the only thing he was consistent on the last part of the year was not getting on base, you know what I mean? Or, or driving runs in or hitting home runs. And, and so, and his defense wasn't always there. Either. I, I'm not here to bash everybody in the twins organization. I'm just saying I'm butthurt as a fan. I am oh, yeah. extremely butthurt. I feel yeah. like I got fucked and not even kissed this year. It, it's, it's, <laughs> It, we, you know, with Royce, like, again, it, it's just a young kid being stupid. You know, when he said the whole I don't do slumps comment, I, I'm like, oh, damn it. Why did you say yeah. that? Like, that's – you're just asking for it at that point. And, you know, I get it. You're When you're young, you, you want to, like, oh, that sounds cool in the moment. It does. Um, but, man, he hit, like, what, 218 since he said that comment. Yep. Um, you just knew it was coming. <laughs> so, I don't know. So interestingly enough, because um, I did read Patrick Royce's um, column today, and and you know, and I'll, I'll give Royce credit. I've, apparently, he said that the Twins were not going to make the playoffs like September first, and he took a little bit of flack for it. Um, where most of the month of September, I I felt like they weren't either. But I just want to read what what he put because he made some good points in his in his column today about. You know, the wh what exactly the twins are going to look like next year, and how the prices when you go to the ballpark are consistent with every other major league or, or professional uh, team around. But he made a good point. He said, This is 81 games that you got to put fans in the stands, and you're not going to be able to do that with a subpar team at, at those prices. But now here is what his, his, his solution to this problem was. He believed, and, and he was basing this all on Ricky Nolasco. Remember that terrible decision and how much we gave him just to go on vacation and whatever, um, and, and saying, like, we can't do that again this next year. And this is what his solution was. Um, we are already, he said, we got to start our rebuild next year. Now, wait a minute. We're a team that just won our first playoff series in 20 years, and he's already saying it's a rebuild. And so he says, let's rebuild it right now. Correa and Buxton play when they're able to, of course. Um, but when not, play Brooks Lee at shortstop and rookie Emmanuel Rodriguez in center. Carlos Santana, you did fine. Thanks for the memory. Put Julian at first? What? And tell the new hitting coaches to fix him. Oh, well, that's that's easy, Patrick. Or use Jose Miranda there. 
Lee, Austin Martin, and Luke Ketchel in the infield. Ketchel, am I saying that right? Keishel. Keishel? Keishel. Who's never played a major league game, has he? Has nope. he been up? He hasn't okay. even hit triple A. Okay, in, in the infield, play them with Correa and Royce Lewis. Walner, Trevor Larnick, Rodriguez, and then find a young right-handed hitter for the corners. Uh, Camargo is your catcher and give Jeffers maybe one more chance. And Will Castro can hang around if he doesn't get too pricey. Then he goes on to say, Lopez, Bailey over, Joe Ryan, Festa, Woods Richardson, and maybe Griffin Jacks, why not, as your starters. Um, and put some younger arms in, including lefty phenom to be Connor Pre Prelip. 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 I'm, I have not heard of that guy. Okay. I am not ready to say it's a rebuild already. That that that's why he's not a coach, not a GM, not that is atrocious. I'm sorry. Right? Like because look, these are these are minor league guys that you're going to rush. Connor Prelip, high draft pick, uh, 2022, um, had Tommy John or whatnot pretty early. Um, was pitching real well, made it to Double A this year. But you're going to throw him in the in the big leagues next year? Absolutely not. What do you, some of these Emmanuel Rodriguez, I could see coming up, you know, some of these other guys, but like, like Luke Kieschel, no, uh, I, no, you, you have plenty of pieces that can win right now. You do not need to start a rebuild. That would be atrocious. Well, I mean, under that, that philosophy, then they might as well fucking call up Walker Jenkins then. Right. I mean, it, it seems Stupid that you were so close last year and we're already talking about this stuff right now. Yeah. And, and it's, you're going to see some guys get traded this year. I, I think Paddock, I think Jeffers, I think potentially a Vasquez, if you can get off his contract um, are going to get traded. I don't call that a rebuild, more of a retool type of thing, because you're going to try to go get major league talent, similar to a Jorge Blanco trade a Pablo Lope, the Pablo Lopez trade. Um, and you're going to see some of these young guys. I think you'll see a, a, an Emmanuel Rodriguez next year, stuff like that, but that doesn't mean it's a rebuild. Um, because by that logic, this year was a rebuild with all the young guys you brought up and everything. So I agree. And, and you think for a second under that same idea, Patrick Royce, that you're going to put fans in the ballpark for 81 games out of the year with, with a lineup like that. I mean, it, um, but I, but I am concerned about whether or not they do bring in new faces and someone not like man, uh, Margot, because that, you know, not another one, Hey Rocco, he's old for 39 as a pinch hitter. Let's put him in as a pinch hitter this time. Cause this time he's going to get it. You know what I mean? Like, all right. Yeah. That one, you know, I was excited when we got Margot. I, I really liked him and this year was not. Not a year for him. Uh, as much as he hit lefties, I'll give him that one. He did hit lefties, but um, no, I would have rather had Kyle Garlic out there than uh, than <laughs> Manuel Margot. About him. All right, all right. Well, enough about the ugly. Um, now I want to get to uh, the bad because you know, and fine, I'm negative, but here's the deal. I'm going to be just like Braveheart right now, and I'm I'm looking to peck a fight. Uh, Let's talk Minnesota Timberwolves because obviously the big the big news is uh, the, two, the the Timberwolves have now finally traded Carl uh, Anthony Towns for Julius Randle, uh, the guy that you like, right? Who's that? Genzo, right? And uh, uh, Bates Giop that we'll never see probably uh, except in garbage time. And then we got a first round uh, conditional pick, which which we should break down. Um, but I, you know, as far as pegging a fight, I I do because um, there was only one other person. I I think you and I are kind of on the same page. Out of all my wolves friends, there is only one other person um, who did not vehemently disagree with me because everybody else thought we we have won the world championship now. I was not happy with this trade um, only for the fact of Julius Randle. That, that is my, my problem that I have. They've been dangling this trade in front of us for like a year and a half. And I said, the one guy I never want, if you're going to deal cat fine, but I don't want Julius Randle. 
And, and so my whole point, and, and we will, we will slice it the different layers of, of what this means, because there are, there's good and bad in this trade, but Julius Randall is definitely the bad of this trade because he is more of a head case and a piece of shit than Carl Anthony Towns, in my opinion. Okay. And, and so my, the reason why I'm upset about Julius Randall, Oh, he's a three-time all-star with the Knicks. Yeah. Right. Uh, there, there are two things that I, I, I want. Well, hey, before I get to that, go ahead. What, what do you want to say? Because we already know how I feel about it, and I'll tell you why. But your, your thoughts right off the bat. <laughs> you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna chuckle. Um, I've had my time to think about this trade. Okay. Um, I had my day to mourn. Um, you know when it happened. I think I broke the news to you over text. Um. I was not happy. You were not happy. Um, I very much loved Carl Anthony Towns on this team, especially this team. And, you know, I grew up watching him play ever since I was 15 years old. Um, but I've had my time to do my research. I've had my time to mentally prepare and look at this season. Um, I think this team is a hell of a lot better. I think – I, I kind of kind of like this trade. Okay. Kind of do. Okay. So I stand alone and it <laughs> seems like I do. Um, here is my prediction. And, you know, it, we, we break down a lot of things and some things we're right on, some things we're wrong on. I think at the beginning of the year going into the twin season, I think we were right on that because we said, I don't think it's going to go the way that, last year went, whatever, and you, you went out and you alienated a fan base. The Timberwolves are in a very similar situation. They got farther than the Twins, but the Timberwolves were like, okay, and when you have success at that level, you don't want to take steps backwards, right? We're, you know, we're like the Detroit Lions. We ain't won shit yet, okay? Now, I was completely wrong on the Minnesota Vikings this year. It's only four games into it. And you had some excitement for Sam Darnold. And I, I give you flowers for that. You were in four games. You were, you were correct on that. I was completely off base. And I, I read this. Team. I did say if their defense shows up this year, they might be competitive. Okay. Their defense is well above whatever. And we will get to the Vikings also. But here are my predictions for the Wolves this year going in. I do not believe that Rudy Gobert is going to be as effective this year as he was last year for the Wolves. I'm not going just based on that he didn't show up in the last two playoff series that we had last year. I'm not going on the fact that he was not a factor in the Olympics at all. He, he didn't even play in crunch time down the, down the stretch for – for, for his, for his country. I don't believe Rudy is going to be the same player this year. And here's the second part of it. I don't think that Julius Randall is going to have very good chemistry with Mr. Gobert. Okay. And if that happens, remember I said, Julius Randall, he is a bitch. He pouts just like towns, but even worse, like where he won't, he'll sit at the end of the bench and won't talk to anyone. And he will absolutely be a bitch. If that happens, and you take the scoring away that Towns gave you, okay? You're you're gonna you're gonna hope, and I've already heard. Well, Nas Reed is really gonna pick it up this year, and I hope that that is the case. But I've already read articles about where there are already Chris Finch is already saying, well, no, our our next scorer is gonna be Jade McDaniel's. He is because we we haven't utilized him the right way. When the ball's moving, you're gonna see now. There's things I like about Jaden McDaniels, but he is not as advertised. Not yet. He has not been in my opinion. And so you are putting a lot of hope and prayers that Jaden McDaniels offensively is going to be what he is defensively. That's a lot of hope. Okay. You're hoping that Julius Randall isn't going to be as big a bitch as he was. And I believe me, if he gets down, it's going to be a whole different deal. And it took towns, well, 
not a whole year because he didn't play that year, but he didn't know exactly how to play with Gobert right off the bat. If, if, if Randall cannot figure that out, you're, you're in, you're in trouble scoring wise by subtracting the amount of scoring that towns bring. Now, listen, I'm not a huge towns. I understand the whole thing, but I'm saying that I don't want addition by subtraction. And if that's what you did, and I know that this trade has opened a lot of other windows or doors for this organization, supposedly I'm just not ready for, and everyone said we're going to be better this year than we were last year. I'm not so sure. So, and those are, I think a lot of the thoughts I had going in. Um, my, my biggest, biggest thing was not necessarily would I rather have Cat or Julius Randle? It was more the chemistry aspect because I feel like that is a major aspect when it comes to winning ball clubs. Um, Cat was, was a big part of it. Um, now I will say, uh, Julius Randle scores more than Cat does. Um, he adds a different aspect to the game when it comes to what this team needs to do. Um, when I think about Cat driving to the basket, um, and that's what really opens up the offense is Cat being able to drive to the basket if he's going to sit on the perimeter, which he has been. Um, I found some interesting stats on this. Um, Cat drove to the basket about nine and a half times the game. He had a 20% pass rate and turned the ball over 10% of the time, which is not good um, on, on those. Randall drives 14 times a game um, from the perimeter passes it 40% and has a 10% assist rate, turns it only turns it over only 6% of the time. That's when your offense is going to be moving. You're going to get Nas Reed involved more. You're going to get Jaden McDaniels involved more. Um, I think you've added an aspect of toughness, which Cat did not bring um, in Julius Randle. Um, I think the toughness adds to him potentially being a bitch sometimes. Absolutely. I'm not going to throw that away. Um, I think he has some, some anger issues. Um, but we also see, we also saw cat have incredible issues with the referees a lot of the times. Um, not saying that they even out, but I, I think you've added a degree of toughness with, with Julius Randall that cat didn't bring as much. Um, Randall has also played next to Isaiah Hartenstein, who's very similar to Rudy Gobert as well as Mitchell Robinson. So he has aspects or experience with playing with a five who, who really just sits in the paint a lot. Um, and Julius can move out to the perimeter. Um, he's going to get the ball moving. I think chemistry wise, from what I've seen, Anthony Edwards is already, Anthony Edwards just seems like a guy that brings people together and can get along with anyone is from what I've seen. Um, it seems like Randall and, and Gobert are already building a connection, which is cool to see. Um, do I think it's going to take time? Absolutely. But you also got to look at, you know, Adding Dante DiVincenzo, who by the way has scored 11 points in nine minutes uh, yesterday in their first first preseason yeah, game. I get it's preseason, but um, this is the best bench in the NBA. It's the best bench in the NBA. I will say they they are deep. If if you are getting it, like I say, I I do have some reservations about about scoring because we've seen droughts, you know. And, and you talked about chemistry. I think that Edwards is a guy that's likable at least right now. Um, likable enough, but you know, Towns was his boy. Like there was no bigger cheerleader than Anthony for Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Edwards. You know what I mean? And, and so, you know, it, if I'm, if I'm wrong, then I, then I apologize because I believe I called some of my very good friends idiots. And I told another one to stop shoveling the, or start smelling the stuff that he's shoveling. Um, I, I hope the best for him, but you know, the, the one thing that I, I overlooked because I was so passionate about it is that everyone wanted Towns gone that I know of because of his contract. And that is a huge matzo ball that they, they just got rid of over the next four years because I, what was it like 47, 51, 53, like the next, it incredible, which gives you more options if Julius Randle, because I believe Randall has an option on his contract next year, right? If so, if it doesn't work out, good riddance, right? And then, and then you do have to 
reinvent stuff. Um, but it does give the wolves a lot of flexibility as far as money that they can use. They are probably the deepest team that I've ever seen in my, in my life as a, as a wolves fan. I'm just hoping the chemistry is there and what they bring in with Julius Randall, that he is able to buy in to what the wolves already started upon last year. And he does, he loves Chris Finch. He was only with them for a year, but he's already said that, that he is so happy to be uh, reunited with him. Um, but Julius Randall is, is my biggest concern. And everyone tells me that I shouldn't worry about it, but that is, that is why I was pissed. And, and I, I make no bones about it. I said it the first time I heard that rumor. I didn't want this to happen. If I'm wrong, man, I love being wrong when it comes to stuff like this. Yeah. I mean, Julius Randle is obviously the X factor in this. Um, you know, if you're looking at, at paper, they're very similar players. Um, stats wise, I think that's where it becomes interesting. Uh, people wise, they're obviously extremely different. Um, but I, I really like to look into, um, you know, when you talk about chemistry and looking at first first impressions of these guys and how are they interacting with people, how are they interacting with with media, how are they interacting um, with teammates, the community, whatever. Um, it seems like Julius Randle wants to be here. It, not that he didn't like New York, um, but it, you know, he said it feels like a breath of fresh air. Uh, DiVincenzo is probably going to play a little more here uh, and get a little bigger of a role. Um, so it, you it just think that, seems, does that hurt? Uh, nod? Do you think Alexander Walker? I mean, because they they've been hyping him about what a great year he's going to have, but with DiVincenzo, that might you know what I mean? It, it and it might um, you know if if Nikhil can't shoot the ball, I mean you got Dante who's who's essentially. Uh, a step one step below Steph Curry at this point from what he's shooting. Um, so I don't know. And, and I think, I think DiVincenzo, uh, they might play him at the one uh, next right. this year. Um, and then you, but you still got Dillingham who, who looked pretty flashy uh, last night as well. But, um, and then they've even said Josh Minot had one of the best summers of his career and is looking really, nice really good. Last night too, right. Um, and like, like you said, this is the deepest team we, we've ever had. And I think, you know, if, if an injury comes about, it's going to be real fun to just next guy up type of type of mentality right now. Well, it will be in it, you know, because I think that you have two rookies this year who may not make an impact this season, like what I'm hoping, but I think eventually they are going to be a big part of this team. I mean, I, I really enjoyed what I've seen from them in the summer league. Um, they had their first preseason game, I think last night and, it's funny. I, I was mentioning on it. I just got a text because when the trade went down, one of my buddies texted me and we kind of had the, the back and forth. Not as, not as bad as some of my friends, but he just <coughs> texted me this, uh, this morning. He's like, I don't know, man. I know it's preseason, but the wolves look dominant. They look really good, man. And mark my words, this is going to be a better team than last year. And I'm like, well, but you got to look at who played in the game last night and who didn't play. You know what I mean? And it, it still is preseason. Um, so I, I don't put a lot of stock in what they did last night at all. Um, to me, it's a summer league game. It, it's a, it, it absolutely is. And I think fans have the tendency to, if your team does well, it's like, oh my gosh, this is going to be awesome. When they don't do well, then it's, well, it's only summer league, so it doesn't matter. Or uh, preseason. But, um, you know, the, the difference that I looked at when you looked at who was playing last night. Um, and I get it. It's game one. It's preseason, but the Lakers, first of all, their depth is not great. And so you, they were rolling out three starters in garbage time minutes with our garbage play, our garbage right. time players just to not get blown out. I mean, w the, these are our, our end of the bench was playing with three Lakers starters uh, and playing very well. Um, which to me is is a little bit of an optimistic take of I think you know even the end of our bench is going to compete um, at a high level, which is something to to keep in mind. Okay, so I want this to go down in the moment of the show to be named later history um, because I'm going to say it right off. Um, 
I predicted uh, the Wolves will not get by the first round in the playoffs next year. Your prediction right now, because I do want to come back to this moment at the end of the fucking year. Well, let's do let's do this because look, and if they have a shitty year, I will absolutely take uh, whatever is coming for me. But I'm <laughs> I'm a little bit optimistic. Uh, how many games? Is it, let, let's go. Let's go. How many games are they going to win this year? Let's put an over under, or unless you want to do a number. Um, I'd say forty eight. So if you if we said fifty games over under, you're going to take the under. Yep. See, I'll take over i think 51 is where where they're gonna be yep. gonna sit um, and, and how did they do in the playoffs i have them losing in the first round well i feel like if i already <laughs> it's it's anthony edwards i'm gonna say we're uh at least a western conference finals team wow okay because I believe when I got the I news from you, I texted everyone. I said, say goodbye to the finals, NBA or Western Conference. But, hey, I, like I say, I hope that I am absolutely wrong on this. I really so do. Let, let's I say this. If, if you say it's a first-round exit team, if they make it to the second – you know, we talked about this last year, the fact that, like, hey, you know, even if we lost to Denver last year, what is was it a win of a, of a right. season? Um, for you, let's, let's say even that, Hey, they won 56 games. They were crazy. Uh, they made it past the first round lost in the second round. Is that a win of a season for you? No. Who said no, no, no. Okay. And, and I'll tell you why, because last year I did not, I was wrong about last year completely again. And they did things that I, I did not expect them to do. And they got out of the first round which I did not expect them to do. I thought they were going to get spanked by Phoenix. And then all of a sudden you had all this momentum that, that went the right way. And I said, even if they lost to Denver, yeah, it would have been a success because I didn't expect them to do it. And because we never get out of the first round. My point is when you get to a Western conference finals, your whole plan is to get better than losing in the Western conference finals. So getting to the second round uh, next year, to me would, would be a, a failure because already done that last year, except we won in the second round. And so that would, and, and my point is unlike the twins, we need to keep pushing forward. And, and that's maybe why I was so butthurt about the trade as I coming off a twins debacle or whatever it is, but no, if, if the wolves don't achieve the NBA finals next year, then it's a, it's a failure to me because your whole point is to get better. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. I again, I'll, I'm keeping my prediction. I think this is a Western Conference Finals team. Is I think first of all, uh, whoever's in the East can fuck off because that's the easiest <laughs> easiest conference I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, when there's a chance that I was just looking at, you know, we got this Detroit Pistons pick. I was like, okay, yeah. when when could this convey to us? Um, and in my head, I was like, well, the Pistons suck. They're never, you know, this is going to be a second round pick by the time we we end up getting it. Um, but I, look, I'm looking at their roster, which is not good. But I look at the no. Eastern Conference. Yep. Detroit could be a seventh seed this year. I'm that, saying. And that, I'm glad that you brought it up because I did want to touch on that because that was another upside considering we don't have first round picks in Minnesota anymore. And we did get that. But then I was looking at it. I'm like, okay. So they're protected. The first year, I think, is seven, right? And then it goes – uh, no, I think it goes seven, nine, 11, and then eventually it goes to a second round, right? They're all protected. Let me look because it, it's like three oh, I years. Of protection. I got it here, I think. So – oh, I did have it. I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm pretty sure – that it, it, it comes to that, that in the first year, it's top seven is protected, right? Here it is. Okay. First one through 13 in the first, first year. Oh, one through 13 is protected. I'm sorry. It goes down as a year. I'm sorry. I, I got that mixed up. It goes like to 13, 11 and seven or, and then a second round, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So I thought about that and I thought the same way. I'm like, Detroit is terrible. They're horrible. They got J.B. Bickerstaff, I believe, uh, as their coach this year. They've been horrifically bad. 
But that was the point. The East is so bad that they're this rising talent team that we might be able to actually get a conventional player out of that out, out of that that pick. I don't know. That's neither here nor there. Um, but uh, it is exciting. I, I'm excited to see Anthony Edwards and what he's going to look like this year. Um, like I say, I don't hold a lot of hope out uh, for Rudy and Julius, but uh, you know we've been. Here's, I've been wrong here's what before. I'll say. It, you know, and and I've been wrong on with with a lot of these Timberwolves decisions recently. But I will say, um, I think we have the best GM in the game right now, in Tim yeah, Conley. And and he, look, I, I've what decision of his has been bad? Like when you look at it. Right. I, I, I mean, no, you're you're right. You're you know what I, I you know, and you put together uh, well thought of. It was very articulate. Uh, you put together some really good arguments about this that I can maybe see that side of it. Um, but I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, everyone wanted to crucify him for the Rudy deal, uh, and it, it looked pretty bad at the time, and and it worked out to for the team to do something that they'd only done one other time before based on that. He hasn't made a, any choices so far where you just went, Oh my goodness, what are you doing? Uh, so I I'll give you that. And, and so maybe I need to just settle down and, and wait and see what the finished finished product is. Uh, the bottom line is it, it clears up a lot of money in well, the next. It does. it does. And you know, even years. with this even with this draft pick, I mean, look, like, let's say, you know, it, it's first through, sorry, 2024. It looks like it's one through 18 is, is, is owned by, by the Pistons. So let's say, let's say they get the 19th pick in the draft. Tim Conley's going to look like a genius. I mean, yeah. like, like he, he is, you know, again, I, I think it's going to end up being, we'll probably get it in 2025. Um, when they have like the 14th pick or something, but, um, you know, it, it could turn out really well. And like I said, like, I mean, he's traded all those picks, uh, which I thought was going to be a disaster, but even the picks that he's, he's used have, have been turned out really well. Terrence right. Shannon, Rob Dillingham, I mean, Leonard Miller, Josh Minot, like these signed Nas to a, a, a really good extension, Nikhil. Yeah. Mike Conley, man, he has just been he's, on he's fire. He's done a good job, and and that's why I hope that he is he is here for for an extended period of time because he he has made good calls and and you know like I say maybe I should just just wait and see um, what happens. All right, we are going to end with the the good because we have gone already over. Um, reason we haven't been around the last weekend we were scheduled uh, to film film uh, an episode and. I got the the privilege of being able to go to uh, Green Bay for the Vikings Packers game. Um, and first of all, before we get into the Vikings, which I was completely wrong about, um, I do want to say uh, I do want to give a shout out uh, to good friend. I, I mentioned him every once in a while, Perm, and my other friend Jessica. Um, these two individuals, good friends of mine, who have. Uh, given me experiences and taken me to more games than even my own parents did. And I, I don't know what I've done in life or in past lives um, where I, I deserve such, um, such good, generous, their, their generosity is overwhelming. Um, but they have just been very, very kind to me and have given me a lot of experiences. Um, not only games here, but across the country. So I just wanted to say thanks to Jessica and P for that. Uh, Boy, last weekend was fun though, man. And I'll tell you, four and zero, baby. And and you know we got the Jets in London uh, tomorrow morning, which sucks. Uh, even if the Vikings were to lose, I mean, I fully expect now for them to be five and zero going into the into the bye. But if they aren't, if they're four and one, they've already well, well gone above any expectations that I've had for this team. You know, I said I was wrong. I had them winning six games this year. They're already at four. Yeah, I remember going through the schedule, and I think you had in the first five games thought they'd win one, and that was one the, the Giants. Five. Yep. Yep. So, um, 
you know, it, it's, it's, it's so fun. Um, especially watching, uh, Mr. Darnold cook. I think he's, uh, really right. I mean, I think he's fourth in MVP right now. He's most touchdowns in the, in the NFL. Um, and he's looking good. The defense looks fantastic. I think this is a five and O team. I don't, I, I just don't know that I see the jets coming away w- with a win unless it's something crazy. Right. I, the only thing, and I, like I say, I want to give you credit again because you, you were the only one that I had, well, not the only one. I've got another weirdo friend that was a huge Darnold fan. I'm not saying you're a weirdo, but you were the only one that was kind of optimistic about Sam Darnold. I'm like, eh, you know, how is he still available? Blah, blah, blah. Um, first of all, so I'm going to give you props on that. Second of all, Sam Darnold, I went, congratulations. Uh, NFC Offensive Player of the Month, uh, not since Justin Jefferson. And, you know, I, I don't remember the last quarterback that we had that won that award, but uh, Kirk, Kirk Cousins did? Once. He did? Only once his whole time. He threw for 500 yards the other night. Anyways, uh, I I am, you know, I mean, we're, we're playing with house money right now, uh, except for the fact that this team looks damn good. And, uh, you know, it was... It was fun. You know, I one, one of the best experiences in the world is to go watch your team on the road. Um, going to Green Bay, I wish I would have, you know, for three quarters. I've, I've never been to an away game. Three quarters, we were up 28 points, you know, going in. I was talking shit all game, though. And then in the fourth quarter, I was like, oh, man, maybe <laughs> I shouldn't have been so loud. Like, because I was feeling like, here it comes, here it comes. And we should have beat that team by three or four scores fine. But here's the point that I made to all my friends. Minnesota Vikings teams in the past would have lost that game. They would have lost it. Oh yeah. Right. And they didn't. And one of the reasons was because O'Connell gave it to Darnold thrown on first down. I mean, I loved it. We only up six points and he was like, Oh no, no, no. We, we let this one get away, but we're not going to let it get away. Then he almost did by kicking the field goal instead of taking the six. I get it. I understand why he did it. But old Vikings teams would have lost that game. And so fuck out of here. We're four and all, and I love it. And it, it's it's a matter of um, you know, the defense took it as a loss. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, they gave up 22 and a quarter, which isn't isn't great, but you know, obviously it's only the first four games, still gelling, still learning. Um and Green Bay just came firing. That was a good team. Um, but you know, that's a that's a fight through adversity kind of game. I, I know Bill Belichick was talking about this team isn't real until we can learn that they can play from behind, um, which they still have yet to do. Right. But in my head, in my head, that was it. I mean, that was you were playing. It, you had to fight, fight, fight for that the end of that because they just kept coming and coming and coming. Yep. Um, and Darnold led a, a fantastic drive to get, get three, right. um, up there. And, and that was, uh, that was cold blooded and, and the defense still had some phenomenal, uh, some phenomenal, um, four turnovers, right? Yeah. I, what was it Byron Murphy or can't, or can't bind who had the, the interception, he had the, the interception out. and the punch out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, and, and the jets offensive line is not great. All right. And, and, you know, there's already this controversy between the head coach and Rogers about him calling what cadence is that the word they use yeah. uh, about him trying to draw teams off sides because it's worked for so many years for him. Um, supposedly there is no rip, but I say you come at Rogers every down, you know, I think Denver is the only team that blitzes, I, I think they blitz more than any team in the NFL, and it showed last week it got to Rodgers. I say do the same thing to them. The, the one thing that I'm disappointed about is that – now, I went to the the Niners game uh, at home. I wasn't at the Houston game, but you saw what the, what the crowd – you know, I know the 12th man lives in Seattle – but I'd never seen anything like that. The Texans had what five penalties in a row offensively, like four false starts. And that was all attributed to the crowd and the way that it gets in that stadium. And you're not going to have that in London uh, tomorrow morning. And, and even though it's our home game and that's the one thing, because I think the crowd would play into it. Aaron Rodgers knows that. And one last chance 
for us to break his shoulder at home would have been nice, but I, it would be, I, I guess I would be disappointed if they didn't win tomorrow, but I wouldn't be upset. You know what I mean? That they, they go into the break four and one, you got Hawkinson coming back. Um, this team looks good and, uh, and deep, you know, offense and defense. It does. And you know, it, the, the fun part about Brian Flores, I think we were, we rushed the most last year. Um, but the, the best part about it this year is you don't know necessarily what's coming anymore because you've got maybe how many guys lining up at the line and four come and four drop back or what we're not like, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, whereas I felt like before it just, okay, you know, a blitz is coming, you know, a blitz is coming. Um, Flores has, has mixed up this defense so well, and it is so tough on these quarterbacks. Even in Aaron Rodgers, is, I think, is going to have a lot of issues because also we got Mr. Ivan Pace coming back as well, who's going to be yep. Um, yep. a big piece. Uh, I'll, but I will say, though, uh, Gr Grugier Hill uh, looked fantastic. Yeah, I, good. I was just looking his name up because I, I can't – yeah, I can't yeah. figure it out. But go ahead. No, Grugier Hill looked fantastic. He's, he needs some more snaps uh, this year. But I, I getting Ivan Pace back is going to be – going to be big um you know it's just it, everything's clicking right now um and it, it is so fun to watch right now that, and that's what's so cool about like like you said like the defense now you know they re you really don't know what's coming with this defense i think purdy said and i think he found flores after after the game um and just went man i ain't seen nothing like that CJ Stroud, I really like that young quarterback, not just because he's a Christian, um, but he did not look good against this defense at all. Um, Love, it was his first game back, but in the first half, couldn't figure it out. And you're talking about uh, the guy that took paces. They couldn't figure that out because that play that he got that interception against Green Bay was – he was left to his own devices and was able to make the call about where he wanted to be on that play. And when you line up like you're going to blitz and then you get, you fall back, Love never saw him. And that's because of the way that this defense lines up. You don't know what package. And, you know, my deal has been you put pressure on the quarterback nonstop, it, you're, you're going you're gonna to get the dividends that come along with it. You know what I mean? And that's what they've been doing. And when – Vikings teams that have no pass rush, you give the quarterback enough time. But here's the other thing. Apparently, our secondary is covering receivers. You know, I, and I don't, I don't want to say that because there have been quarterbacks that have put up numbers as far as passing yards or whatever. Because they have to pass. Right. Right. Because because they're not running it on us as well. And, and so I, I've i never, in not one of those games, Green Bay was a little tricky at the end. But now one of those games that I really feel like we were going to lose the game. You know what I mean? And that that's something, you know, the Vikings fans don't get the luxury of a lot of the time. Right. I mean, you touch on the corners. I mean, did you remember we have Stephon Gilmore on our team? Yeah. He's been fantastic. You don't see anything about it because they're not throwing. Because they're not throwing to him. I know. It's like throwing to Deion Sanders. You've never heard, oh, that was Gilmore that got beat on that. Yeah, that was just a veteran game. You don't hear his name being called because you're right. They don't throw to his side. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 <coughs> it's so much better this year. It is fun. Um, year. And I, but I will say, uh, you know, I'm, you've, everyone's heard about how I feel. I mean, what a drag though, you know, like get up and believe me, I had my first beer at seven 30 last Sunday, but that's because I was at the game and tailgating is a part of it or whatever. This whole getting up at seven in the morning, you know, and I had buddies that were like, Hey, and we're going to get breakfast. And I'm like, I don't always eat right away at right when I get up, you know, and, and, you know, when you're at home, it doesn't feel right to maybe have a beer at eight in the morning or whatever. It's just a drag, uh, the way I feel about it because the rest of the day, like my, my whole schedule has always been, you know, your noon games, your three o'clock games, and then your seven o'clock game. If you've got enough football in you, and then, of course, you got Monday night. You know, by the time this game's over, it might be time for a nap. And that's the only thing I, I have a problem. And that the crowd, I don't think, is going to be the same, obviously. It, in, it's not going to be the same. But I will say, um, from what I've seen, people have seen two Jets fans 
there are a lot of Vikings fans. Oh, yeah. A lot. They do um, like them. Yeah. That's but that you know, heritage. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and um, I, 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 uh, I typically have to work around noon on, on Sunday. So eight 30 is actually not that bad for right. me. So I can actually watch and pay attention is a little more, um, yeah. but, you know, it, it's fine for me, but, uh, do you have a prediction? Give me a score, uh, for tomorrow. For tomorrow. I'm going to say 27, three Vikings. I had 27, three. 27, 13 was mine. Wow. They, I think the defense is going to slap Mr. Rogers around quite a bit tomorrow. And that's what I, I'm hoping. No, I think they will. And, and to me, 13, is it's going to be one of those, they get a last kind of second touchdown. Uh, in my head, you know, they got shut out from the end zone last week. I, I think Rogers comes back at least with one touchdown uh, and they'll kick two field goals, you know, during the game to make it somewhat interesting but yeah. I, I yeah i i see this defense playing with a chip on your shoulder on their shoulder like you said they looked at it maybe as like a loss almost last week or whatever but you didn't see them uh, against the giants against houston when the game was in doubt or was was no longer in doubt when you knew what the deal was they were still playing like it was a tie ball game in the fourth quarter. Like, like they were going to be offended if they scored, you know, if, the, if, if, if the Texans scored a touchdown on them at, towards the end of the game. And I don't believe that they did at the end of the game, allow um, a, a touchdown at the giants either. So um, I want to see a very aggressive defense tomorrow. And like I say, I I'm hoping that by the next time that we, um, that we talked that that the Vikings would be undefeated going into the bye week. Yep. All right, man. Anything else on the Minnesota Vikings? No. No, let's get a win. All right, buddy. Uh, I believe we have gone a little a little more than over uh, this week. By the way, the Minnesota Lynx are two and one in the uh, what the, the playoffs. Um, so. Uh, you know, we, 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 we can't handle the good, the bad, the ugly. Maybe the bad is for me now, after my nephew has been able to calm me down a little bit more than my idiot friends. Uh, not all of you are idiots. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's not necessarily the bad, but uh, we covered a lot today. We will try to get back again uh, uh, within the next five or six days so that it's not this big layover so that you have to watch two hours of us ranting and raving. For Noah Storzinger, I'm Johnny Voss. You've been watching the show to be named later. We will see you next time.